one. Welcome. These, uh, this is the first of a series of supplementary videos on Lecture 5, The Function and Rearrangement of Immunoglobulin Genes. In this case, we're going to start looking at exactly what parts of the gene code for what parts of the smaller of the two peptides in the antibody. And so we're going to be using, again, models uh, of the structure of the antibody, uh, photos of that, diagrams of the light chain, color-coded to correspond to the gene. And we're going to go through that and give you an idea of what part of the genes code for what part of the protein. To start out, we're going to do a really brief review uh, of antibody structure. And what I've done is I've drawn an antibody up against a ribosome to give you a feel for the scale. So if you look at this, you can see here we've got two short, the short parts of um, the antibody. And these are the smaller peptides, but for some reason they're referred to as the light chains. And that just seems to be a quirky antibody uh, terminology. If you look at the rest of the antibody, these are the heavy chains. And they're held, everything is held together by disulfide linkages. So it's about 10 nanometers from there to there. And that's what we're looking at. Now, I drew it in another way to give you a better picture of how it's all arranged. And in this case, I've done something that shows you the immunoglobulin domains. And again, if you need some review, you can go back to the lecture four. But here we've got one heavy chain here in light blue, one heavy chain in dark blue. In reality, these two chains would be identical to each other. Here is a light chain here in golden orange and red orange back here. And so again, we're going to be looking, first of all, at how you make this light chain. The light chain has two domains, one of which basically attaches to the heavy chain, here and here, and the end of these, this domain here will be the variable region that binds to the antibody. I can call this the CDR, or complementarity determining region. Notice to bind to an antigen, we need a combination of the complementarity determining regions of both the light and the heavy chains. So let's take a little bit closer look at the actual peptide that forms that important part of the antibody. And what I have up here is something that if you've been to class, you've seen it all before. This is a photograph of my um, antibody model, the physical model that I bring to class. And in this case, you can see here, this is the light chain here, this is the heavy chain here, and here, and the other light chain. In these, this case, I have drawn how the peptide is arranged in the immunoglobulin subchains, and you can see that it goes back and forth and back and forth, and that's a beta pleated sheet. Now, we're going to look at very closely just this part here of this antibody, and I'm going to take it out and look at it closely and then look to see how it's coded for by the gene. Again, this part in here is the complementarity determining region, and you'll see we've got loops in there, and this part is the constant region. So this whole part here is constant, and this whole part here at the end is variable. So here I've got the variable, and here I've got the constant domain of the light chain. If I take a closer look at what's in there, which is to say, I'm going to take this part and blow it up. And so now, if you look at this diagram, you can see that from here to here, we have the variable domain. and the constant domain. 
okay? Within the variable read part of the variable domain, we have a variable region, the V region, and a joining region here that joins this to the constant domain. So here is the J, or joining part of the variable domain. Here is the variable part in pink, joining in yellow to the constant region or domain, and they get together here. Now, what's going to be interesting is that as we rearrange genes, we are going to be putting together separate regions that code for the variable and the joining domain, and we're going to join the genes in the region that codes for this part here, the end of one of the loops. So I have a peptide here. I start out making it. This is the amino terminal. And so the first part that I uncode is the part from the variable domain. And then I uncode and use for information a part where the variable and joining come together. And then I put together the joining and constant regions in the message and make the entire peptide. And then, of course, with the carboxyl terminal here. And, of course, if you remember, protein synthesis precedes amino to carboxyl as it reads the message from 5 to 3. So the message that starts here will be the upstream end. The message as it codes for the end part here will be the downstream region. So if I want to look at the part of the DNA that codes for that, I'm going to see that I have a constant region right here. And it turns out that for the chain we're looking at first, the kappa -like chain, there is one and only one constant region. So we're looking at the kappa gene. And sometimes we just use K. Okay? The kappa gene then has one coding region that codes for the constant region. In humans, it has five different regions that code for the joining region. All right, and it also has, as it turns out, 35 regions that code for the variable region. Oops, I'm running out of space. I will have a diagram of this in a model that I've done on yarn that I'll show, you, I'll show to you in a minute. But the way we get the variability in this recognition region, so that we have all of these different kinds of antigens that we can identify using our antibodies, is that we have 35 different options, different things we can put here. We have five different options of, uh, of DNA sequences that we can put to code for this part. And when we mix and match them, you see you've got combinatorial uh, uh, mathematical huge numbers of different combinations of V and J. And to make things even more interesting, at this critical point here, where we have one of the recognition loops, we're going to do a lot of just sort of throwing of the dice and putting in random nucleotides, and therefore we'll get even more variability here. Happily, when we put together this part, into the message, we use splicing enzymes that don't do anything to the DNA, or rather the RNA sequence, okay? So we're going to make actually a copy of the uh, DNA, and we're going to splice the message together here, and we won't fool around with that joint at all. So this joint is part of the rearrangement. This joint is not. 
So here we go. We're going to be looking at the rearrangement of the kappa gene for the light chain. The kappa gene is a big honking gene. It has over half a million bases in it. And it's half a million bases to code for something that only has 238 amino acids. I mean, I can code for 238 amino acids with 1,000 bases. Um, and yet I have 600, as it turns out, times the number of bases I need just to code for one section, one version of the protein. The reason that, part of the reason at least, that I do this is that I'm going to only be using one out of 35 of these variable regions and only one out of five or so of the joining regions. And when we go look at the genes, we will see that each of these variable regions has on its downstream end a recombination signal sequence, a series of bases that say, hey, pick me up and stick me to a joining region. And we will have the corresponding set of signal sequences on the upstream ends of the kappa, uh, kappa joining sequences. And we're going to put one of these together with one of these at random. When we do that, we're eventually going to get a gene. We're going to transcribe that gene. We'll look at the primary transcript in a later video and then process it and produce this structure here. What's going to be interesting is if we'll look at the kappa gene and we'll look at the other lambda gene and we'll see they're quite different, but when they're done, they're going to make something that looks very much the same. Now, to give you a better feel for the gene, what I did was I colored a long piece of yarn. And if you look at this one here, you can see, if you feel like it, you can count 35 different pink regions, each one of which represents a section of the DNA that codes for a different variable region that's going to make up the variable domain. And if you look at this one, you can see we have five joining regions that are going to be joined to it. So when we rearrange the kappa light chain gene, we will put together one joining region with one variable region and cut out everything in between. So here's our constant region. Not going to mess with that for now. Here's one of the joinings. Here's another joining. And so let me just pick a joining one out at random. Ooh, let me use this. Now, if you look at this joining region, you can see here I have the part that codes for ultimately what's going to be the peptide. Upstream from that, I have a three-part region that's going to allow this to join with a variable chain. And I'll get more details on that in the next page. So I'm going to pick out one of these guys at random. And so let me pick out this one. Now, I'm going to put this one, this variable region, to this joining region. And what happens is I'm going to line them up, and eventually I'm going to cut and join them right here so that my ultimate gene that codes for the peptide will have a joining region, a variable number of the signal nucleotides, and then the variable region. And what I'm going to do then is cut out all the DNA in between so that the ultimate rearranged gene is going to be shorter by a loop of DNA that represents the sequences that are cut out. When that happens, I will upregulate the promoter at the beginning of this. And we'll see this is a leader. We'll see this in a minute. And the RNA polymerase will attach here transcribe down, transcribe through all of this extra stuff and into the constant region, and then process it out. What about all of this stuff upstream? That will remain there, but it gets ignored. Okay, So you can see that sometimes we have a lot of variable regions left over that we're never going to use, and sometimes 
we have very few. If I used uh, a variable region on the far upstream end, I could cut out most of this gene. This gene is actually a millimeter long. It has that much DNA. So this is where we're going to stop on this one. On the next one, we're going to actually line up the sequences and see how, this, how the enzymes cut and rejoin them to give us the variety of genes that uh, helps to make our antibodies capable of recognizing so many different antigens. How long was that? Oh no. Uh oh. What happened? It doesn't seem to be. Oh, Brian. I wonder if I even record.